A great question. Hi, Julie. Hope you're doing well. I did watch the documentary over the weekend and it brought up a lot of questions for me. But what I want to know right now is why are we talking about uh, asthma? Okay, this isn't asthma, everybody. My daughter has asthma and, uh, you know, these things don't go on with somebody that has asthma. We're looking here for symptoms such as what we would look in for a diagnosis of Munchausen by proxy. And after watching the documentary, I noticed a lot more symptoms that her mother matched up with in terms of what the diagnosis would be for Munchausen by proxy. And I think the key factor here also is what I just noticed from the testimony is the amount of ketamine that was given to her daughter and how she continued, continued to want to have that medication given to her when the doctors at the hospital were clear on saying that this is not healthy for somebody like her. And by the way, Julie, I looked this up. I'm not a medical doctor. However, what I did look up was that ketamine can cause loss of coordination and impaired motor functioning. Wow. Has anyone talked about that yet? Wow, Dr. Sue. You know, I'm sure they will if they haven't already. As you know, we've kind of gone in and out of this trial because there are other criminal cases, as you know, we're following. But that's huge. Just as I know from research, and I believe this was presented in the opening statement by the defense. I'm not sure if I saw it come in yet through a witness, but ketamine can also cause upset stomach. And we know she presented with stomach problems at the hospital. Uh, this is just all around very, very tragic. And today, Maya is back in the courtroom, Dr. Sue, as you saw, and on Friday when the defense was really having a great day. I would say, you know, I like to say in trials, you know, sometimes you have one side or another winning day by day, and that changes, and you don't know who the overall winner will be until the end, but Friday, the defense won the day without question. A huge admission from Jack Kowalski on an audio tape saying that if they got Maya home from the hospital, he would have Beata move out, and it came through a police detective witness, so uh, that was very bad. Uh, Maya wasn't there in the courtroom Friday, but this is her live this morning in the courtroom. There were two videos played, Dr. Sue, that came into evidence from the defense. Uh, not good for the plaintiff's case at all. I want to have our director play them for you. Let's start with the one where there's a karate chop going on, Maya and her brother playing together, and uh, he holds up a pillow at one point, and uh, the defense... Uh, look what they've done with this. They have slowed it down and they introduced this as a piece of evidence. Uh, so we have that video and another one. And remember, these videos are taken at the time that she's going into the hospital looking paralyzed and, and presenting as, you know, debilitated in her physical condition and, and weak. Uh, and, oh, I'm being told this was recorded right after Beata's death. Uh, thank you to our control room. Right after Beata's death. This was recorded. And what about the other one? The other one with the dog. She's chasing around a little puppy dog uh, around the table. And apparently that was recorded after Beata's death as well. I'm being told, okay. So remarkable improvement after her mother's passing, which look, I think we can all agree. Suicide is awful. It is just awful. It is so tragic. Our hearts break certainly for uh, their loss. Uh, but legal liability here is a whole different question and whether or not there was any malingering going on or I wonder, Dr. Sue, you'd be the perfect person to answer this with your expertise. Let's just say for the sake of our analysis, not saying this is the case, but let's just say Beata Kowalski is afflicted with Munchausen by proxy and now little Maya is suffering and from a very young age, this is being ingrained in her that she's sick, she's ill, she feels pain, she can't walk, all of that. When she gets up on the stand as a teenager, beautiful, articulate, she was so impressive testifying, and she's giving her truth. It is, in fact, her truth, right? So if, I'm just saying, if the mother had that and inflicted that on her daughter, it's not like she's lying, right? This is what she believes. Yes, Julie, you nailed, you nailed it, okay? So 
I work with kids all the time that do not speak to their parents, okay? It's called alienation. And parents say to their children all the time, this isn't true, this isn't what happened, but it is the child's truth about what happened. And you as a parent cannot change that. From what I've seen, she completely believes what happened between her and her mother. She sees her mother as her primary caregiver. She sees and believes that her mother was the one that was caring for her and taking care of her and that she could do no wrong to her. Why is that? It's because we want more than anything as a child to trust our caregivers. We're supposed to trust our caregivers. They are the people that we feel the safest with. Why would we ever want to believe that they have hurt me? If she believes or she starts to say that her mother was hurting her, then she's gonna have to live with that for the rest of her life. Right, Dr. Sue, right. Uh, excellent points uh, from you as always. I want to talk more about this, and we will on this show this hour. I'm getting word uh, that the jury is coming back with their questions, so we're going to listen in together live at that and then do some more analysis. So uh, stay with us, please, at home. We're going to hit this break. Thank you for watching Court TV Live. We are your front row seat to justice.